welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming out. Uh, this talk, as you know, is about evolution in creation. There will be two talks this week and next week and these are occasioned by uh, the occurrence of what's called the Clergy Letter Project. And Father Bill was um, sent an, an email about this. Uh, and the Clergy Letter Project was started by Michael Zimmerman back in 2006 or so um, to bring together parishes from around uh, the world, primarily North America, and increasing, and initially uh, churches, but later on synagogues as well, to discuss the relationship between evolution and Christian faith. And... Uh, Father Bill was uh, forwarded a notice of this organization, and then he asked me about it, and I said they were really good. And, and Michael Zimmerman is an evolutionary botanist. He's not a clergy member himself. And uh, before the, our congregation endorsed their efforts, Father Bill felt that it would be useful to make some presentations about what evolution was so that our congregation was informed about this. And that's the genesis for uh, these two, uh, so to speak, <laughs> the, the genesis for these two talks. Uh, and this one is going to be specifically about uh, what evolutionary biology is, because, of course, most people don't really know what evolutionary biology is. I hear it's very controversial. But they don't know what it really is about. And, and the purpose of this talk is to talk is to discuss what evolutionary biology is and how the concepts in evolutionary biology are actually found in the Bible. They're not spliced together into a theory of evolution within the Bible, but the, the uh, items, the, the individual concepts are already there. So there's nothing inherently foreign to uh, the Bible or to Christian belief about evolution since the ideas are already contained in the Bible in pieces, in bits and pieces. Um, and then next Sunday, we'll uh, discuss some of the uh, theological uh, aspects of the theological takes, if you will, on evolution. And there are different uh, faith traditions that have reacted to evolution in different ways. And, uh, and so I'll try to present a taxonomy of what the different uh, points of view are uh, in uh, different religious communities with respect to uh, evolution. And of course, you can take your own position and, and come to your own feelings about it. So to begin, oh, and, and just to identify ourselves, uh, I'm Joan Roughgarden, and um, this uh, lectures or talk is taking place in the Goodall Conference Room of St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church in Lahui, Hawaii, and uh, it's February 12th, 2012. My objective with these cameras right here is hopefully we'll be able to... Uh, package this as a little YouTube video so that other people can listen to it and maybe make it available on our website as well. So I'm, I'm not an expert on all of this technology, but <laughs> we're all going to learn. Okay, so here's what the issue is. Oh, and also before I really get going, but I, I have a total of 17 slides. Uh, uh, a total of 17 slides, and hopefully that's uh, going to take us about a half an hour. And that should then leave us a good 15 minutes for discussion. We faculty, I should say, we faculty are used to 50 minute time slots. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, was, uh, I was trained, I, I ran for office once in San Francisco, and when you're when you're attending a candidate forum, this is years ago. When you're attending a candidate forum, you're given three minutes for for any given response. And I remember quite vividly someone asking, "Well, what would you do to solve the problem of the homeless?" You have three minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, so forty five minutes, you know, seems truly luxurious in, in comparison. Okay. Part of that is factored in, as you can see, Kauai time. <laughs> everybody sort of wanders in. Right. Hi, this is being recorded, everybody, so just yeah. everybody be aware yes. of that. Oh, watch your language. Watch your language. 
minimize <laughs> noise. Yeah, you can go. Okay. So here's the issue uh, right here, that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about what evolution is about in the country as a whole. And so that in 2004, 65% um, of all Americans favored teaching creationism alongside of evolution. And then in 2005, uh, another poll was taken, and the same answer came up. And, and then what's especially interesting, the 40% favored replacing evolution with creationism in the science curriculum. So these are big numbers. So these aren't fringe views. These are major chunks of the American population. And then in 2004, this is especially interesting, 65% uh, approved of teaching both evolution and creation from among physicians. So MDs don't differ, basically, from the general public. And that reflects the fact that the pre-med education doesn't include much instruction about diversity or about evolution, it's specifically on physiology and, and topics of more direct medical interest. And then there's a bit of a breakdown. 11% of the Catholic doctors, only 11% only of the Catholic doctors believe that God created humans exactly as they are now, whereas 35% of the Protestant doctors do. And that reflects the fact that, as we'll see next week, that uh, the Catholic response to evolution has always been quite positive, and there's actually a papal encyclical that endorses uh, evolution, whereas it's the objection to evolution is primarily in Protestant denominations. So you see that reflected there. So this means, I think, that we need to have a discussion, that uh, there's nothing weird about us as a congregation if we're uncertain about what evolution is and uncertain about our own views. Okay, now what I'd like to do is list what I think are the key evolutionary facts, and then follow that up with what evolutionary theory is. So I'm going to make a distinction between fact and theory. And fact is fact, <laughs> and theory is how we explain the fact. And the big fact, uh, evolutionary fact, is that one family tree unites all of life. We all, every living creature, is a member of a common family tree. So that if you hug a tree, <laughs> you're actually hugging a distant relative. <laughs> and and if, you, if you hug a starfish or a worm, perish the thought that you've also hugged a, different, a distant relative. And a graph like this, and I'll show you the next slide as well, these, the family tree of all living things is truly a, a, a huge uh, picture, a, a huge diagram. You can't fit it all on one slide. And these are the small things, the single cell organisms, the bacteria, the different kinds of bacteria. These are also single cell organisms here. Uh, the, uh, you see methane in here. So these are organisms that live in methane-rich environments. And this is, you see the thermo here, thermal proteus, this lives in hot springs. And then we get to these groups, the so-called eukaryotes, which are the animal, which are the single cells that have a distinct nucleus within them. And you see this little twig over here, animals? <laughs> animals and plants? Well, um, to continue, here are some animals. <laughs> so you take that twig and, and follow the twig out, and you get to the, all the different animal phyla. The sponges are the most primitive of the animals. The cnidaria are like cylinterates, uh, like corals. And the echinoderms here are, uh, are, sea are, are, are starfish. And interestingly enough, the vertebrates are part of the, the uh, lineage right here that is, shared, that, is, that is shared with starfish. And so on down the line, all sorts of Phyla, many of which you've probably never heard of. Annelids are the segmented worms, and <coughs> nematodes are uh, little round worms. Now here are insects. So these are the ones with external skeletons with jointed appendages. And then if you go to vertebrates, there'll be different kinds of vertebrates. Uh, you know, amphibians and 
reptiles and so forth. And so these are specifically uh, mammals. So among the mammals, these are all the different mammal groups. And here are the primates. And then you can expand the primate twig to get to all the different kinds of primates. So the, this, the information for this is based on uh, shared DNA, the sort of information that's used for paternity analysis. And basically, I've, been, I've envisioned that it'd be nice someday if you could buy a little kit, uh, like a chemistry kit that they sell high school students. Uh, it'd be nice if you had one, I'm envisioning it have a little funnel in it. And then you'd like take a, a caterpillar and you drip the caterpillar in the funnel and it goes crunch, crunch, crunch. And it spits out how closely related you are to a caterpillar. <laughs> and, 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 and you could do this. I mean, this is. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and it would. And the, because this is not a myth right here, it, it really is a fact that we share uh, genes in common with all living things. And. It's not a theory, it's a fact. You can confirm it at any time you wish. And uh, just like the fact that the Earth is round, you can confirm that any time you want. So that's a fact. Um, and people should know this. Now another fact, it's not an evolutionary fact, but it's an ecological fact, which is that all life is interdependent. And you probably know this already, of course. And this is often represented in so-called food chains or food webs. This is uh, in the ocean out here. If, if you take a tiny, uh, if you take screen, now it's, a, it's better to, to take the kind of screen that you know when, when you're making tea uh, in a teapot, there's the very fine grain, fine screen that you put the tea leaves in, and uh, that, that very thin screen rather than the kind of screen you put on windows. You take a really uh, thin screen with tiny holes in it, and you just stroke that through the water in the ocean. So if you go out on a little uh, boat here, a little fishing boat, and you just just hang overboard and just just uh, um, uh, take it through the ocean, just just drag it through the ocean for uh, a few hundred yards. Uh, hundred yards, and then pick it up and look at it, you'll see all of this little stuff in it. And that's what this looks like right here. If you then then take it out and uh, uh, brush, brush it out, like on a little plate, and look carefully, and even with a magnifying glass, you'll see all of these little organisms. And this is called plankton, the green stuff, which photosynthesizes would be phytoplankton, and then the brown stuff, basically would be zooplankton, uh, and, and here's a crustacean. This would be zooplankton here. These eat the small um, green cells, and they're in turn eaten by fish and on, and on up. Now, this is highly simplified right here. A more expanded one would be, an exist, would be a picture like this, where you have dino, uh, this is a kind of uh, photosynthetic single cell that algae, and here's another kind, and here are different kinds of zooplankton, which eat these, and, and, on, and on it goes. Now, in a picture like this, uh, one of the things that you notice right off is that to these two species at the same level here, uh, sharks and, and marlin, uh, to some extent eat the same prey. So that means they actually compete with one another for these prey. So you find the food winding its way up uh, the food chain here. And that's also a diagrammatic picture. And one time, when in my own work, we tried to make an accurate account <laughs> of what one looked like. And I used to do a lot of work in the Caribbean, uh, particularly on lizards. And so this is the food web as seen by a lizard, uh, which happens to be this node right here. And so the lizards eat insects, the insects eat leaves, and, and meanwhile, there are parasites and predators that eat the lizards, and uh, an attempt to make an accurate food web, uh, food uh, chain, leads to a picture like this. Now, uh, are these strange notions from the standpoint of uh, <coughs> a, a Christian tradition? 
And I'd like to point out that these facts right here, uh, that all of life is interdependent and that we all belong to one family tree, uh, is consistent with the idea of community as one body, which of a Christian community as one body, which you see in passages like this. We being many are one bread and one body. This is about Holy Communion. We are all partakers of that one bread. And then we have this passage, which is often uh, read on Sunday. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because uh, I am not the hand, I am not the body. But now God has set the members of every one of them in the body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, among these we bestow, bestow more abundant honor. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. And one member honored, all members rejoice. Now you are the body of Christ. And this is basically the idea of an ecosystem, where all species in the ecosystem uh, have a role and have a place, and, uh, and they're all united by common descent. So I think that this is a, a, the, what ecologists and evolutionists have found is really an extension of this metaphor of the Christian community as one body, which was found in the Bible. Now, the other uh, main evolutionary fact is that all species change through time and place. Okay. Now th this is a very big deal. Because the contrast here is between a biological species and a physical species. Now, physical species would be something like water, or uh, CO2, or oxygen. That, that's a type, a, a kind of compound. Now, early on, the, the, when Linnaeus was, was working, the thought was that there would be a whole suite of biological species that would be the counterpart of the physical species, and that the job of biologists was to go and make the counterpart of a periodic table of elements for biology, similar to the periodic table of elements that exist for physics. Okay, so what, and, and I hope you get the idea right here, that if you can't, for example, find different variants of water, you can go anywhere you want around the world, and water always freezes at the same temperature and boils at the same temperature. It's always transparent. It's not as though you go to Argentina and then you see, well, this is Argentina's water, or this is Finland's water, or this is the water in Europe, which is different than the water in North America. Water is absolutely universally the same everywhere. But that's not true for species. Species vary. Biological species vary from place to place. They're fundamentally different from physical species. And, and I have some illustrations of that phenomenon, that species vary from place to place. They're just not constant in place or in time. And these are lizards uh, uh, related to the uh, lizards around here, the chameleon, the green chameleon. Uh, and these happen to be the ones who are native to Hispaniola. So Dominican Republic's on this side and Haiti's on this side. And these are the dewlaps underneath the chin ever seen those. And you can see right here that uh, from place to place around the island, the dewlap of this species, called the Nolus disticus, varies. It goes from white to red to orange and so on. And you can rent a car, and I've done this, you can rent a car in the Dominican Republic and drive around and every 10 miles get out and look at the lizards. And they're a little bit different than they were 10 miles earlier. And this, this is really an obvious phenomenon to document. This on an island, and you can do this on, on the mainland, it's especially easy if you're driving across country and you get out and you look at the robins uh, along, say, Route 80, which goes from the west coast to the east coast, and you see that the robins change along the route. And here's, a, here's some, some examples that I photographed from the island of Dominica in the West Indies. This is a small island, not much bigger than Kauai, um, not much smaller than Kauai. It is, it is smaller. But um, on the northwest coast, 
uh, they're, the, the lizards have no spots on them. In the middle, in the forest in the middle, they have all these white spots. That's why it's called Anolis oculatus, or, or uh, eye spot. And then down in the lower left over here, where it's more deserty, they have a reticulate pattern. And so, and here in this part of the island, they have tail crests. It's all one species, and you, and you just go mile by mile, and it change, they change progressively from one form to another. And so, this is called geographical variation by uh, biologists, and it's a fundamental fact that species are variable like this. And here's another picture. These are from, these are African birds that I uh, found on the web when I was putting this together. These are lovely slides right here. You can see how the, the red changes, the background color changes. And see over here. And this is true of any species which has any kind of widespread range. If, if, if a species is found only in one little river valley, then you won't find this kind of phenomenon. But once it's broadly distributed, it becomes general. And here's another case. Bumblebees throughout um, <coughs> Southeast Asia. And <laughs> isn't that neat? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then the question is, is, is this an un do, is, is this fact at all at odds with the Bible? And I think there's an interesting passage uh, in the Bible which, in which uh, it's actually discussed how species change. And this is this interesting story of Jacob and Laban. Jacob, as recompense for previous injustices, makes a deal with his master <coughs> to keep for himself the cattle that are speckled. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger cattle did conceive, the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger were Jacob's. So Jacob's are the ones doing all the breeding. <laughs> and, the angel, and the angel of God spake unto Jacob and said, Lift up thine eyes, and see, all the rams which leapt upon the cattle are speckled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I love that, left it <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what happened right here is God's hand molded the, the evolution of the livestock in Jacob's favor. So the, the, the stock became increasingly speckled through time, and they became Jacob's. And so Jacob is, so God is, in a sense, determining who does the breeding. And as a result of who does the breeding, then the stock uh, evolves to resemble those who do the breeding. And there it is, you know, right, in the, right in the Bible, uh, the change of a, uh, of a species through time. Now, okay, so let's get, that brings us to evolutionary theory. And the job of evolutionary theory is to explain those two facts. Namely, that um, all of life is united, is related, uh, through membership in a common family and that species change through time. And this, in a nutshell, is evolutionary theory, the way that's explained. Um, now, there are two elements to this, what's called mutation and uh, natural selection. So imagine, hypothetically, that you start out with a species where everyone is a light gray. So, say this is a... This is a species that lives in some habitat where light gray blends in with the background. Well, so, it's, so this is cryptic in this environment. And then there's a mutation. And the offspring of this individual are light and then just the same as that individual or darker than the parent. Now, what's a mutation? Now, mutation simply means a copying error. Uh, when the gene is passed from the parent to the offspring. Because as we all know, our genes are, are put into our eggs and our sperm in, in order to make offspring. So we pass our genes to our offspring by depositing them in the egg, in, in the egg and sperm that we make. But some of the time, the copying isn't exact. About one in a million copies is not uh, exactly the same as the original. And I, in the book, I use the analogy of copying on a Xerox machine. You know that a Xerox copy is not a, 
the same as the original. There will always be little differences. And in, in, when, during cell division, there are, there's machinery in the cell to guard against mutations or you know, copying changes, copying differences, but some of them still sneak through anyway. And so you get about one in, one in a million. So when you get a mutation, there's nothing weird about a mutation, just a little, it's just a little different from the parent. But when you get a mutation, the, uh, it, it actually is not obvious in advance whether the mutation is a good mutation or a bad mutation. Maybe the mutation actually made, made the gene, made the product of the gene function better. I mean, that's possible. I mean, it may, may be a good, good mutation or a bad mutation. And so then you, then uh, the, the individuals who carry these mutated genes, and that one isn't mutated, get out into the environment and have to live, survive in the environment and get, uh, and reproduce. And the bad ones uh, don't work. So they either die or fail to reproduce. But the others uh, chug along. So this one go ahead and makes offspring, and this makes offspring. So we have reproduction. And now, in this little diagram right here, the idea is that uh, the, the dark gray one is assumed in this diagram to actually be a favorable mutation as opposed to an unfavorable mutation up here. So you can imagine, for example, that between the time when the habitat began, when, when all the trees were covered with light bark, for example, suppose this is about a caterpillar, or, or moth, and there was light bark, but then a lot of smoke came out from nearby factories and dumped uh, smoke on the trees, and so the trees were darker. So all of a sudden, having a dark color made for better protection from birds. In that case, a favorable mutation which darkened the coat would wind up leaving more offspring than the original one. And so when the environment changed, then what was a favorable mutation changed. And, and that's how the species then adapts to the environment, <coughs> that when a favorable mutation turns up, which fortuitously matches what the environment then uh, needs, so to speak, uh, then the species will come to resemble that. So that, that in a nutshell, that's evolutionary theory. And that's, that's what's taught in class. Yeah, and that's, and it's all, all you need to know. <laughs> Now, now, the question... Can you mutate back? Oh, yeah, you can definitely mutate back. Yeah, so there's forward and back mutation going on. Um, so if the environment... So if they clean up the smoke, if they clean up their act, then there might be a back mutation to this type of color, and then the, the species would evolve back to that. And so species are evolving uh, forward and back and all over the place through time. Now, is this also a weird notion from the standpoint of the Bible? Um, and I don't think so, because there's a lot of passages that involve this idea of pruning, and this is a particularly you know, explicit one here. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband, and every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, that it might bring forth more fruit. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me can do nothing. If a man abide in me, he is cast forth. If a man ab abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And this is the notion of pruning, and the husbandman, and this is a metaphor throughout the Bible. Um, and that's exactly what natural selection is all about. And the more problematic uh, concept for, for many people of, uh, in Christian thinking is the notion of a random mutation. So the idea of a copying error right here. But the notion of randomness is also present in the Bible. And there's nothing strange about the idea of randomness either. And, and here there's this passage, uh, which I know many of you are familiar with, all of you familiar with about, about the farmer selling seed. 
Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and divided them up. And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell onto good ground, and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's a very interesting passage, because the seeds are being tossed at random into different parts of the, of the earth. As the, and sometimes by chance, by luck alone, some seeds land in a good spot and grow up, and other seeds don't. And uh, you can think of a mutation really as like a, a seed, a seed of DNA, a mustard seed of DNA that's just being tossed into different bodies. And some seeds, some mustard seeds of DNA, um, wind up landing in good soil. And so the carriers of that DNA wind up producing a lot of young and uh, bring forth fruit, sometimes 60-fold, some 30-fold. And the, the situation right here, of course, is that Jesus is talking about, send, talking about his message, and he's broadcasting his message to a crowd. And the idea is that some who can understand him will benefit from the message. Those who can hear, let them hear and others uh, will not listen to the message and will not prosper. Now, of course, in principle, Jesus could know who will hear and who won't hear. And he could, in fact, have directed what he says precisely to those who hear and, and not bother giving the message to those who can't hear. But instead, he spreads the message out broadly to the entire crowd and let those who can hear, hear. And that's what's going on with random mutation, is that, that the, seed, the seed is just being spread across all different types of individuals. And then the individuals with whom or in whom the seed prospers will be the ones who produce lots of offspring. So this notion of randomness, I think, is in the Bible. There's nothing foreign to it, uh, um, it to a Christian tradition. And so there's... There's no reason to be so upset about uh, the idea of randomness, which um, many folks writing in this area are and who are concerned about. But the direction that evolution comes from the selection part, not from the mutation part. And the outcome of, of natural selection is that the species gets better and better in the environment. It uh, becomes more fit to the environment. As the environment changes, then... The evolution tracks evolution tracks the change, and the species then comes and uh, fits in with that, with the new state of the environment. So, uh, this is then just a plug for the book, um, <laughs> and uh, and then this is the very last slide is the picture credits. So that's uh, that's what I had by way of of presentation, a formal presentation. So now we can. Yes, and it was about a half hour, so now we can just chat, if you'd like.